Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar brought to you by SharedServicesLink.com and sponsored by AB10. Many of us in Shared Services are focusing this year on electronic invoicing, and what we really want to understand is how to compel suppliers or what compels suppliers to come on board at an attractive pace. So I'm very pleased that today we're going to be examining the five reasons why suppliers actually want to invoice you electronically. So let's have a look at our uh, speaker panel today. I'm very pleased that uh, joining me, Susie West, I'm the founder and CEO at SharedServicesLink.com. We have Trevor Stewart-Sweet, who's e-procurement manager at Premier Farnell, and Ernie Martin, who is head of global supplier marketing at AB10. So you'll be familiar with how the questions work, but just to remind you, it's so important that you utilize these next 60 minutes and get the answers that you are seeking. So we have um, Trevor on this webinar today. Please feel free to uh, post to him or, or via me any question that you would like to have an answer to. This is such an important um, opportunity that we've got here, and it, it really doesn't happen very often. So do make sure that you maximize that. Uh, all you need to do is submit your question to me via the little box that's highlighted by the, the red line there. And I will ask that in the last 10 minutes of the webinar on your behalf. So just before we hand over to our first presenter of the day, let's just have a look and remind ourselves of the context of, of this webinar today. So electronic invoicing is, um, is a, a wonderful solution that's been made available. And it's been made available really in the marketplace for the, for the last 10 years or so. Um, but as far as your particular adoption success, it really is reliant, your project success is reliant on how many suppliers convert to electronic invoicing. So if you, you, if you have your 100,000 um, paper invoices, your, your program is only as successful as the number of invoices that convert to electronic and therefore the number of suppliers that convert is really, really very important um, to your program success, your project success. So you could easily say that converting suppliers is your single point of failure. If you don't manage to convert suppliers, then you'll be looking at receiving paper invoices moving forward, which is something that we clearly do not want to be doing um, um, in this age of shared services. Regardless of how amazing the technology is, and um, um, obviously compliance, compliance is massively important, but you must have um, your suppliers converting in order to have a successful program. So let's absolutely embrace this opportunity and, and get inside the head of a supplier and um, understand what makes uh, suppliers tick and find out what the five reasons are that um, this particular supplier signed up to in the invoicing. But just before we do that, uh, we are going to kick off with our first poll of the day. So coming up on your screen now, ladies and gentlemen, if you could uh, indeed Pick the appropriate voice, um, appropriate um, box, coming up on your screen now. So, specifically to the buyers that have joined this webinar today, how many invoices do you process manually? So, if you can exclude your 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 electronic invoices, how many invoices do you process manually each year? Less than a hundred thousand. 50 to 150,000, 150 to 300,000, or more than 300,000 invoices that you receive coming into your account payable organization manually each year. So if you can take the box most appropriate to your own situation. We like to get these numbers up nice and high. We're currently just shy of 50%. So if you haven't ticked the box, please do so. And we do share the results. It just gives us a good flavor as to what the, the landscape uh, representation is of the um, companies on the webinar. So if you haven't ticked the box, please do so close in the poll in three, two, one. Just over 50% there. Let's have a look at the results coming in. An interesting U-shaped graph, if you will. We've got 31% less than 50,000, and 31% uh, coming in at more than uh, 300,000. So interesting results there. Okay. With that in mind, 
I'd like to introduce please our first presenter, who's uh, Ernie Martin, who's the head of global um, supplier marketing at AB10. Over to you, please, Ernie. Thank you, Susie, and uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us on the call today. And uh, Susie mentioned my name is Ernie Martin. Uh, I am the head of global supplier marketing for OB10, and we're excited to share a little bit of information with you today about you know, why suppliers want to invoice you electronically. And so as we do that, let's, let's take a moment and touch on why, why e-invoicing should be considered in the first place. And uh, e-invoicing, we're finding, is high on the agenda for many organizations these days. And there are several reasons for that. Electronic and automated invoice processing can result in up to 80% savings uh, compared to traditional paper-based processing. And that's fairly significant. In addition to that, the European Commission's assessment is EU businesses can save a potential 238 billion euros by using e-invoicing. So that's what companies are looking for. They're looking for, for savings. They're looking for a way to have an advantage. In addition to that, um, e-invoicing supports uh, the meeting challenging business targets. So if you've got revenue generation uh, opportunities for from early pay discounts or better transparency into your AP processes, e-invoicing can help you accomplish that. E-invoicing also makes a direct contribution to saving the environment. And by that, um, obviously with e-invoicing, there's a reduction, in, a significant reduction in the use of paper, which has a ripple effect to uh, reducing uh, fuel consumption, energy consumption, landfill use, and the like. And lastly, we'll find out and talk about why most of your suppliers want to use e-invoicing a little later in the presentation. So let's look at some of the companies that are realizing the benefits of the invoicing. And as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly recognizable uh, group of companies. Uh, and these are just a handful of some of OB10's customers. Um, two things you can see initially from, from this list. Uh, number one is most of these organizations, as you can see, are serious about cutting costs and being more efficient. That's part of their DNA, especially these days. Number two is these companies do their due diligence. They make sure that every T is crossed, every I is dotted before they move forward with an initiative like e-invoicing. And so once they do, they see it pays dividends. So if, if you fall into this category of wanting to seriously consider e-invoicing, you would be in very good company. So let's also look at some of the benefits that suppliers who are on the OB10 network receive. We actually do a significant amount of um, research um, around not only our suppliers on the network, but accounts receivable and credit professionals as well. So these are your suppliers, suppliers who are submitting invoices to you. And so it's worthwhile, as Susie mentioned earlier, knowing what makes them tick. And so what we have here is we've got basically three columns of numbers, but there are three areas or categories I will bring your attention to. We ask, we ask suppliers in several different categories. Number one, did you expect to receive benefit from OB10 before you joined the network? Number two, what kind of benefit are you receiving after one to three years? And number three, what benefits are you receiving after three to five years? And the first category we're going to focus on is more predictable payment. So before they joined OB10, suppliers thought roughly 31, 32% of suppliers thought they would receive benefit. Once they actually join the network, you can see it's well over 80% actually receive benefit from being on the network one to three years, as well as three to five years. So let's now look at faster delivery of the invoice. Before joining the network, most suppliers thought, you know, I'll receive faster invoice or value around faster invoice at around 40, 41% level. Once they actually joined OB10, first one to three years, over 78% receive value, and then from three to five years, over 81% actually receive value. And so the last category we'll look at is confirmed delivery. Before joining the network, only 36% believed that they would receive value from being on the network with OB10. But after they actually joined, that number skyrockets to 83.7%, and then after three to five years, 
0.8%. So I think the takeaway here is, uh, and you'll probably run into this uh, with some of your suppliers, some suppliers may be reluctant to join. Some suppliers uh, may be reluctant to engage in e-invoicing. Some suppliers um, may believe that they won't receive value from e-invoicing. But the data tells us that even if that's the case, once they begin engaging in e-invoicing, the value they receive is undisputable. Is indisputable. So uh, that's a key takeaway is that get them on the network, they will receive value. Get them engaged in, in, in conducting e-invoicing practices, and they'll do that. So the next slide is sort of a composite. The first column, 23% what they received on at what they believe they would receive on average before they join the network in terms of value. Once they join the once they join the network, one to three years, the average 74.5% thought they would receive value, and then three to five years, 76% thought they would receive value. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Susie for the next poll question. Thank you very much indeed, Annie. So coming up on your screen now, just very interested to know, um, out of your manually treated invoices, how long it takes to turn them around today? Really following on from the theme that Annie was talking about there, about one key benefit um, really being um, a, a, a kind of a more predictable payment pattern that emerges. So let's have a look um, at this question here. Out of your manually treated invoices, what is your average turnaround time? Is it one to five days? Is it six to 15 days? 16 to 30 days? 31 days or more? So please, we do, as I mentioned, try and get uh, around 70% of response rates for these questions. And uh, they do provide very useful benchmarking information. So if you haven't already ticked the box, what is appropriate? to you and your situation, please do so. Reminding you of the question, out of your manually treated invoices, what is your average turnaround time? If you don't have the exact figure to hand, please give a, um, a, a good uh, guesstimation, a fairly accurate guesstimation of it. One to five days, six to 15 days, 16 to 30 days, or 31 days or more. If you haven't already responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen shortly. So you can see here, um, we've got uh, about 82% of you coming in every day or more. Um, and interestingly, 20% 20, uh, 20 of you coming in at 31 days or more. So interesting results there. Back to you, please, Annie. Thank you, Susie. And continuing uh, on the path of the value that suppliers receive, from being on the network, um, let's sort of continue down that path. And let's look at, uh, on the next slide, let's look at some of the uh, ways we can determine you know, the kind of value that suppliers receive from being on the network. First of all, we looked at by number or length of time being on the network. Now we're going to look at by number of customers. So the same categories, starting with more predictable payment, if one customer, if a supplier is connected to one customer, they receive, or 76.4% of them receive value. If they're connected to two to four customers, they receive 84.7% of value. If they're connected to five to 10 customers, they start to receive 89% or over 89%. And then 10 or more, it still hovers in the mid 80% range. Let's also look at faster delivery. Faster delivery, if suppliers are connected to one customer via the network, 74% of them say they're receiving value. But now when you connect them to two to five customers, 82.2% receive value. Five to 10 customers, 89.5% receive value. And then when you go to 10 or more customer, over 90% of those suppliers are receiving value from being on the network. And lastly, confirmed delivery, with one customer, 80% are receiving value from being on the network. But then when you connect to two to five customers with those suppliers, 86.4% are receiving value. And that just continues to go up. So the takeaway from this slide is not only do they receive value from being on OB10 um, longer, they already re all also receive value from being on OB10 and connected to more customers. So the more customer suppliers are connected to, the more value they receive from being on the network. And so on average, 
what that looks like is you know those connected to one customer on average 69.8 percent of suppliers receive value on average two to five connected to two to five customers 77 percent of them receive value and then connected to five to ten customers on OB10 83.3 percent of them receive value so the more connected they are the more value they'll receive and finally let's talk about this notion of the fact that suppliers want to submit electronic invoices to you and the question may be how do we know that well every year OB10 does a uh, survey uh, in partnership with the Institute of, Institute of Financial Operations uh, we poll accounts receivable and credit professionals in the UK and the US and we ask them a series of questions about their uh, habits and practices around around collections around e-invoicing around traditional invoicing etc and one of the questions we ask is do you believe that by invoicing your customers electronically it can expedite the collections process and what we mean by that is reduce mail time confirmation of invoice receipt fewer lost invoices more predictable payment etc and so the response rate is, again, um, can't argue with it, 85% of respondents believe, yes, e-invoicing does expedite the collections process. Because what it boils down to for suppliers is, as long as they can get paid, if not faster, then at least more predictably. And it's all about collections with, with the vast majority of suppliers. So that's a key takeaway. So if the question ever comes up, does my supplier want to do this, the, the evidence is overwhelming that yes, suppliers do receive value from this, and yes, they do want to do this. So with that, I will turn it back over to Susie for the next poll question. Thank you very much, Ernie, and very compelling statistics there, so that's very useful indeed. So let's find out um, how you're actually processing invoices today uh, based on that um, very insightful information that Ernie just shared with us there. Uh, let's compare that and see uh, how you're processing invoices today, because you can see that um, suppliers are wanting you to invoice them electronically. So let's see how many of you are. How do you currently process invoices today? This is a multiple choice, so please select all that apply. Um, manually via paper, uh, scanning an OCR, uh, through EDI, through e-invoicing networks, um, or are you uh, receiving invoices from your suppliers via emailed PDF, which some people refer to as electronic invoicing, but we at shadeservicesinc.com certainly do not have that within our definition. Um, so just to remind you of this, how do you currently process your invoices today? Manually via paper, through scanning an OCR, through EDI, e-invoicing, um, such as the AB10 network, or through email PDF receipt. Uh, we are just shy of 70% of you responding. If you haven't already responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at those results coming up on your screen now. So you, unfortunately, you can still see that the winner today is manually via paper. Um, and uh, we have 45% uh, e-invoicing. And uh, but had I asked that question a year ago, I'm sure it wouldn't, wouldn't have been as high as 45%. So interesting results. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, now, this takes us very nicely into our interview that we have now with uh, Trevor Stewart Street. So, Trevor, uh, great to have you here with us today. Um, so, I would just be really interested if you could just introduce yourself for us um, and uh, tell us a little bit about what your role is, please, at Premier for now. Good afternoon, Susie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I, I'm one of two procurement managers at Premier Farnell in responsible for the setup and support of the P2P relationships in uh, EMEA, with my primary area of focus being Northern and Eastern Europe and the southern half of the UK. Uh, this responsibility extends to purchase order integration, punch out catalogues and of course e-invoicing. I've also got full support responsibility for a number of major global and European customers. And in that role, I'm supported by a dedicated team of developers based in Leeds and Chicago, and, and they're really the technical brains behind the operation. Okay, thank you, Trevor. And tell us a little bit, um, for those of you that aren't as familiar um, as others, perhaps, of, of the organization Premier Funnel, tell us a bit about the company. 
Premier Fornell was formed in 1996 and is a leading multi-channel high service distributor supporting millions of engineers and purchasing professionals globally. Uh, we've got an annual turnover in the region of a billion dollars and we market and distribute a comprehensive range of products and services and solutions throughout Europe, North America and Asia Pacific. We've operations in somewhere around 36 countries, we trade in over 100 and we employ about 4,000 people worldwide. We serve a global customer base of more than 2 million uh, and we stock in excess of 700,000 electronic products. We've access to about 4 million more and we represent about 3,500 manufacturer brands. Our multi-channel okay. approach includes, sorry Susie. No, carry on please. I was going to say, sorry, uh, our multi-channel approach includes fully transactional websites, contact centers, field sales force, trade counters, a branch network, uh, catalogs and direct mail. And we also have the world's first online community for design engineers, the Element 14 community. Companies within our group, within Premier Farnell, you might recognize as Farnell Element 14, Newark Element 14, Element 14 itself, Cabsoft, CPC, Farnell Newark, MCM, MBEFT, and Acron Brass. So it sounds, Trevor, that you're, you're um, ahead of the game, or right at the front of the game at the very least, as far as your kind of e-commerce activities are concerned. Just then for what you were saying there with your, I think you mentioned 2 million customers. Um, so it sounds like um, uh, getting your accounts receivable operation in really um, excellent shape is very, very important. Um, and as, you know, as far as you being in the distribution business as well, is a is a um, a key kind of um, a key focus for you. Could you just explain to us how your accounts receivable organisation is actually set up? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, each of our regional business centres has their own AR department, and collectively we handle tens of thousands of invoices a month. Uh, but we're still, believe it or not, a majority paper-based organization. And I think some of that was reflected in the poll that we've just had. Uh, and the reason really is simply that the vast majority of our customers are still unwilling or unable to receive electronics, uh, I I sorry, invoices electronically. Uh, or maybe even that they're unaware that there is a capability or a facility for receiving invoices electronically. Um, mm -hmm. It seems in the main that e-invoicing is still the domain of the large corporate company and not so much the SME but even some of the larger companies still seem slow to adopt. Mm -hmm. And what, what are you, I suppose how do you kind of um, um, go out and advocate these large organizations to actually get going with their e-invoicing program? What, what do you do to kind of to beat that drum? Well from, from our own team's perspective, we're only able to do that when we're talking to our customers and we can ask the questions. Um, I think as far as e-invoicing is concerned as a whole, uh, we're not probably as proactive as we should be in terms of asking our customers about electronic invoicing. But again, going back to your poll earlier, there's still some differences in understanding of what e-invoicing really is. Is it EDI? Is it uh, XML? Is it PDF on email? So there's, there's, there's quite a bit of, um, I suppose, education still needed in many areas. Still, still to take place in, in the market, which is quite, quite interesting, um, seeing that, you know, I think, in, in fairness, the, the market's known about e-invoicing networks for, um, for certainly 10 years now. So it's, um, it's quite interesting that, that people still bundle in um, PDF emails into their, their notion of invoicing and, and um, don't quite differentiate the difference between receiving a pure data file and, and receiving a, a PDF which they then need to treat manually so it doesn't really um, eliminate the, um, the touch points. Let's move on and have a look at uh, your relationship with, um, with e-invoicing and how early to the party you actually were. So, so drawing your, your mind back, I understand that you were one of the earlier suppliers to come on to the AB10 network. How early were you, would you say, to the actual party? What what was the timing like? As far as the invoicing as well was concerned, I think it was way back in the early 2000s, maybe 2001, 2002, that we started as a business to consider electronic invoicing. 
Uh, we actually took the initiative and invited a number of third-party providers to our Leeds office for discussions with a view to forming a partnership. And OB10 was certainly one of those that we invited. Okay. And as a result of that um, partnership, that collaboration that was um, made back then, um, how many customers do you now invoice electronically? And roughly, um, how long did that that connection take? To um, how long did it take to kind of get your your first one on board, and then maybe your your next five or six on board? Um, that's really asking me to stretch my memory back now. Um, we've got around about 70 active buyers on OB10 at the moment, and um, I think it was a year or so before the first one came on board from our initial discussions with OB10. Uh, but if I'm honest, it, it's so far back, I can't, wanna, I can't really remember. Um, Do you remember, though, Trevor, if, I suppose my point is, did you, did, uh, did you find that the first few came on you know, over the, the first year or so, and then there was a surge? Or are you seeing that in the last, I don't know, maybe last 12 or 24 months or so, there has been a real push? Are you, what are you seeing in terms of with the, or 70 customers that are asking you to invoice them electronically? I suppose what I'm looking for is, is there a, a kind of a, a development, a trend that has emerged uh, because of the, the pace at which these, these customers are asking you to come on board e-invoicing? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I think after the initial slow start, there was a, a little bit of a flurry, and then it steadied down a little bit. But over the last um, two or three years, we've seen a steady increase in the requests for customers to come on board. Okay. And talk to us a little bit about the volume that you're pushing through electronic invoicing. It's probably not its not that huge at the moment. I think I, I had a quick look this morning, and it looks to be around about 12,000 invoices a year in the 70 active buyers that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, as far as um, what, what buyers on, on this call will be very curious to know is what was the compelling event? So um, what was the compelling event that motivated you to actually make the leap of change from sending the paper to then signing up to um, at the, the network, what was the thing that actually triggered that change? The, well, the main trigger was the, the need to be automated on the whole of the P2P process. But in parallel with that need for automation, we were very, very concerned initially with compliance. Um, with international regulations uh, and also the number of countries that could be fully supported. There was then some concerns around technical capabilities and also the onboarding process that we would have to go through with whomsoever we chose as our first partner. And at the time you must have you must have um, had a, a kind of an idea as to what the anticipated benefits uh, were to subscribe to a network. Um, and the potential kind of cost of subscribing. How did you go about kind of putting together your, your case or your business case um, to actually proceed and, and turn this to a, from, an, uh, from an idea, from a concept to an, a real project? Okay, well, I think, I think there's sort of two questions in one there, really, because the, the first one was the, the perceived benefits. Um, the... First, I think uh, one of the major benefits was that we have a one-time connection with OB10, so we don't have to make lots and lots of different connections and um, work with lots and lots of different technical teams. So our technical setup as a one-to-one -one with connection with OB10 and then therefore a one-to-many to our customers has simplified things greatly. Um, the other benefit was that we could be confident, certainly with, uh, with OB10, who in fact we did choose to be our first partner, that they were indeed fully compliant with all the necessary regulations, and that they were able to, they were they were able to upscale with us and add further countries as and when required. So, in terms of the benefits that we would we would see ourselves, they were the sort of the major ones. Obviously, alongside that, there's there's the cost saving due to automation, and the other benefit that we found with with OB10 certainly was that. Um, they effectively manage the onboarding process and the recruitment process from the customer side. So we weren't needing to go out quite so actively, perhaps, to our customer base and, and um, recruit or onboard. 
In terms of costs, yep, there's a cost involved. Um, and we, we examined those very carefully. Uh, and what we did was we compared the overall cost of engagement with the current cost of the, or the then current cost of manual paper invoicing. And in early adoption days, I think it was probably fair to say that it was, it was coming close to be cost neutral for us. But as volumes have increased, and as we've got more customers on board, as you saw from the poll earlier, or from the, the, the survey results earlier on, it's certainly become more cost effective for us to send e-invoicing over against paper-based invoicing. Uh, there is a sort of a, a parallel to this. There's a lot of companies that we're aware of, or a number of customers or companies that we're aware of that are advertising free e-invoicing facilities to suppliers. Um, it's true to say that we've not yet been approached by any of those as a result of customer requirements. Um, but again, should any of our customers start to use such companies, we would very need to consider very carefully um, before we proceeded to, to ensure that they were fully compliant and also to make sure there were no hidden costs uh, behind the onboarding process, et cetera. So I think over, overall, um, the, 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 what we pay for our e-invoice service has actually proved to be very cost effective. And, and Ernie showed us a couple of bar charts there, really obviously showing that there was a, a development um, over a three-year period where the more buyers that a supplier had coming on board um, and the more invoices that they put through the network, the, the greater the returns were or the greater the benefits were. How, how much do you concur with, with those bar charts um, on those earlier slides? I, I think I'm, I'm very much broadly in agreement with them because um, it really is to a certain extent a question of scale. And uh, as you scale up, obviously, your, your actual costs are then reduced. So yeah, I'm broadly in agreement with what those results findings were. OK, let's have a look at the onboarding process. Um, now, if, 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 when we talk about um, e-invoicing at Premier Funnel, I understand that we're talking largely about the AB10 network that you use. Um, so if you could just walk us through um, what your, your process was um, when you onboarded, but also we'd, I'd just like to layer on top of that what your onboarding process has looked like for you, um, not just for the first one, but for you know, some of the other 70, well, obviously not all of them because we don't have time, but for the first, the first time that you connected and then some subsequent connections that have happened after that. I think we learned a lot of lessons maybe the hard way in the early days. Um, the first onboarding probably took a lot longer because we had to um, align our, our messaging. Um, we had to do quite a lot of testing. And there were a number of things that we probably hadn't quite thought through in the way that we should have, in hindsight, that, that, that we should have done. Um, maybe come to those in more detail a little bit later, but uh, essentially the, the current process with OB10 is technically very straightforward. Our communication routes have already been set up and proven, and so we can proceed with minimal testing prior to go live. Um, our biggest issue really is, is, is the need to uh, correctly and accurately identify with absolute certainty each and every required billing um, identity from our customer side. Uh, we particularly often have customers with multiple bill points, and each of those have got a de different entry in our back office records, which means that we send paper invoices to different addresses in different, uh, different parts of the, of the country. So what we've set up with OB10 now is, is that we won't uh, proceed with a new request until we've received copies of the paper invoices from each and every required billing entity, so that we can, without doubt, identify which of the um, billing accounts in our back office system need switching over to the electronic route. And I think that's probably one of the biggest lessons that we, we learned over time, that it was much quicker to identify very, um, with, with, with absolute certainty, that the, the required billing uh, end, end address, if you like. Have you found that um, over time that the, that the onboarding process when a new when a new buyer comes on board and asks you to connect I mean if you were going to boil that time down into or boil that time down into maybe a matter of hours or days what what are you looking at to, 
to um, kind of honour a new connection. Once we've got all of the required information from the customer in terms of who we should be billing, and we've identified that uh, on our back office system, um, if everybody is aligned, we can probably turn that on within a matter of, um, I would say, almost minutes rather than hours, and certainly not days. Um, it doesn't take very long. If you take the actual process end to end, it really depends on how quickly we can receive the the billing, billing information evidence from our customer. Yeah. OK. And what's your view? Because obviously there's a very, very key piece of advice that you've just extended to the buyers on the line, which is to make sure that when you're asking your suppliers to connect to a network, to actually share with them the, 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 the invoice um, number, um, the last, maybe the last invoice number that you're, you're asking them to be uh, converting to electronic moving forward so that they can exactly find that, that document type. So that's a very important piece of information. Um, how do buyers know, because this is something that I come across quite a lot, how do buyers know who to contact within their suppliers? Uh, suppliers, like Farnell, large organization, one billion turnover. So obviously there are many, many people that they could reach out to, but they want to make sure that they reach out to the right individual. And that often is the, the biggest issue for them. What's your advice to them regarding finding the right person in the organization to, um, to have that conversation with? That's, that's a, a very good question and one that's given us quite a bit of cause for concern in the past and sometimes has introduced some quite considerable delays with onboarding. I can only speak for Premier Farnell as a group. I can't speak for, for other suppliers. but. Um, from our point of view, we find it far better if our buying community would allow OB10 to make the initial contact with us because they know who to contact in our organization in order to facilitate the, the onboard process. Um, in our organization, it happens to be myself or, or maybe one of my colleagues if I'm not available, and, and we will then make the ongoing uh, connections with our AR department and, and whoever else is necessary within the organization to ensure that they're happy to go ahead with the relationship. We have in the past received letters addressed to the AR department, the AR manager, or the e-billing manager, or all sorts of things. It comes into a mail room, and quite honestly, without a person's name on it, they don't know where to forward it. So it tends to go around in circles a little bit until it lands on somebody's desk that understands the process and can then forward it out. Uh, equally, if it's sent to any of our senior directors or senior managers, they're not directly involved in the process uh, and they're not always available. So again, it introduces de uh, unnecessary delays. So f from our point of view, certainly, we would rather that the communication came directly from OB10 and also that it came electronically and not on a piece of paper in an envelope. After all, we're looking at electronic processes and we're trying to reduce the paper. So um, <laughs> it's great if we can have those requests electronically. I completely agree. So also, just let's just spend a moment on the communications, because sometimes um, uh, buyers are wanting to send out a mandatory message. There's huge debates in this market about do you send out a mandatory message, do you send out a, um, a softer message. Um, what's your view, and this might be based on experience or it might just be based generally, um, what's your view, Trevor, on buyers actually issuing mandatory messages? What's your advice to them? Um, I'm just drawing a few thoughts here because I, I, I can understand the need for a mandatory message in some, in some cases because um, obviously our buying community want to automate their process and it's, it's good to get the supplier on board and engaged. F from our point of view, it, 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 the cost of engagement has become quite small. So mandatory or optional, um, as far as we're concerned, we would far rather go to electronic invoicing. It's a fairly straightforward, easy process. Um, I can imagine for a supplier that does not have any connection to OB10, um, that's going to be a bit harder to receive. But at the end of the day, uh, it's our customers that dictate the pace on that. And I think it's certainly as far as we're concerned as a supplier, um, it's 
it's of no great import whether that becomes whether that comes to us as a, a mandatory or just a softer approach. We we, we treat equally, uh, uh, we treat e both e with e equal importance, really. Okay, let's let's move on. I'm curious to know um, what advice you would give suppliers regarding the questions that they need to ask when they are being asked to come on board an e-invoicing network. What are the the two or three or perhaps more questions that really they need to ask in order to, to move forward at a good pace? Uh, sorry, this is, um, you're asking this from a supplier point of view to the buyer, are you, rather than the buyer to the supplier? Yes, the, the, the supplier, the advice to suppliers regarding the, the questions that they need to ask to the buyer um, and also maybe to the network, um, network provider themselves. Uh, well, I think I think the important thing, certainly um, as far as possible, is to have a single point point of contact. The last thing we want is a a chain of contacts in in either organisation. Uh, you know, we get the Chinese whisper effect, where the message starts off in one form or another, uh, and by the time it reaches the ears of the person at the end of the chain, it might be uh, completely different, even the opposite. Um, so multiple contacts can cause misunderstanding. They can introduce delays. So. Wherever possible, try and have a single point of contact at both ends. Um, it's even more important, really, for global networking because with ourselves as a, a global company, our, our technical centers are really either in Leeds or in Chicago. They're both interlinked. And if we get multiple approaches from a global partner, it can lead to confusion. So again, that points back to onboarding through OB10, but ensuring also that OB10 only uses one one point of contact into Premier Farnell. Um, the other thing really is have everything that you every bit of information um, on an email. Don't rely on telephone calls, word of mouth. Maintain an audit trail so that at least you're able to go back over things necessary um, to confirm the the arrangements that have been made. Uh, it's also important that both the supplier and the customer have uh, or, or the contact on both parties really need to have a good understanding of the whole of the end-to-end -end process. So again, there's no miscommunications or misunderstandings. Um, keep those communications well defined. Something else which I think has um, come up occasionally, from a supplier's point of view, to check with the buyers what tolerances have been set up on the invoicing um, end because Things like VAT gets rounded sometimes, especially with ourselves. We have more than one, one or two decimal places. We in fact got to five decimal places on unit prices. So there can be rounding. So just make sure that there's enough tolerance to allow for VAT or um, total price rounding at the end of the day. Good. And Thank I think you very much. the main ones. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, that, that's um, invaluable information there, so very useful indeed. Um, and just before we go to your top five reasons for wanting to, to sign up to electronic invoicing, let's just um, talk about um, kind of what the actual benefits, you know, having come out the other end, as it were, what the actual benefits have been to your organization, perhaps the ones that you weren't expecting. Oh, golly. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that they were particularly any that we weren't expecting um, as such. I think the, the benefits are, are fairly straightforward. It, 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 in a nutshell, it's reduced errors, it's reduced timescales, it results in faster payment, and therefore it re in reduced cost. Uh, so I think really that's the, the main benefit. Um, Maybe some of the other benefits are the fact that we have that closer relationship with our customer because we've got the purchase to pay cycle loop closed uh, and, and we've taken an active role in reducing our, our bank community's costs and equally we've also reduced our own, cost, our own business costs in the process. You talked about if you had your time again, there might be some things that you would do differently. What are those things, Trevor? I think the uh, we've already touched on the, the main one. Which, the, the much of the early pain was actually accurately identifying the billing entities. Um, but equally, I think in the early days, we, we tended just to do things as it came along and not have a, a very well-defined process. I think over time, we've 
with OB10, we've evolved a much tighter process in terms of the way that we onboard. So I think it's a good idea always just to have in the back of your mind what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve it, and then agree that with with your supplier, with your buyer, with, with OB10, so that you've got everything, if you like, laid down before you, so you don't miss anything out. There's, there's no ambiguity, there's no doubt. Let's wrap up um, this interview with Trevor with Trevor's five reasons uh, for coming on board electronic invoicing. So if you could just capture for us the, the five reasons why um, why you in particular and Premier Farnell in particular has indeed wanted to come on electronic invoicing. Okay, I think first and foremost is automation. Um, we do have a strategic uh, well, one of our strategies, main strategies in business, is, is to automate as far as possible. And because we process a very high volume of quite low-value orders, um, it, that's an important thing for us to, to embrace. Uh, alongside the automation, there comes the obvious one of error reduction. And that works for both the supplier and the buyer. If, if you've got a, um, an automated process, an electronic process, there's no rekeying needed. Um, there's even, in, in a lot of cases, very little, if any, manual intervention needed on checking the invoice. That can all be three-way matched electronically. Um, it, it helps to reduce both of our, our costs, and it helps also, in fact, very often, it's the, it's the final link in the chain of P2P um, automation. I think the third, the third um, reason was that we've got a guaranteed delivery of that invoice. When you send something in the post, it could get lost, it could get mislaid, it could end up on the wrong person's desk, get buried in a pile of other bits of paper. With electronic invoicing, the message that, or, the, or, or the, the invoice that we're sending to OB10 is electronically delivered directly into our buyer's back office system. And as a result of that, obviously we benefit from, in most cases, um, faster payment, uh, more accurate payment, and I think the other thing is that, again, going back to the ease of connection, it's only a one-to-one a one -one connection to up for us to, to OB10, so we haven't got to manage a lot of disparate connections to different buying back ends. Very interesting indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so now I'd like to hand back to Ernie for a summary. Um, I'd just like to point out at this stage that um, I... Yes, good. We've got uh, we've got the connection, so that's perfect. I thought I might have momentarily lost it. Um, I don't know if you know, but I'm actually um, covering this from New York, and we are literally just in the throes of going into a hurricane here. So I momentarily lost connection with you, but it looks like we're reconnected, which is fantastic news. Over to you, Ernie, for a recap, please. Yes, thank you very much, Susie and Trevor, and thank you very much as well. And uh, let's look at uh, some of those reasons that, uh, that we identified earlier, as well as those reasons that, uh, that Trevor echoed. Um, number one is the electronic and automated invoice process can help expedite the collections process. And uh, every survey that we've, that we've engaged in tells us that same thing over and over again. And, um, and Trevor echoed that by saying it's, it's about getting paid as well. Um, number two is uh, prompt invoice delivery with confirmation. And as Trevor mentioned, you know, the, some of the benefits around that include reduced cost, reduced errors, uh, automating the process, and uh, certainly guaranteed delivery. Uh, number three would be e-invoicing can result in significant cost savings, up to 80% compared to traditional paper-based processing. And as Trevor mentioned um, earlier, uh, when his organization transitioned into e-invoicing, they actually um, it was actually cost neutral, but it quickly grew from cost neutral to being uh, financially beneficial for his organization. And uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, the EU businesses can save a potential of 238 billion euros by engaging in e-invoicing. Number four would be e-invoicing enhances supplier relationships through increased prompt processing and visibility of invoice status. 
And uh, as Trevor mentioned, um, you know, the desire for his organization as well as a number of other suppliers is that more of their customers would accept e-invoicing. He also mentioned that e-invoicing helps to close the uh, P2P cycle, so, so that's very um, beneficial for suppliers. And then number five, the opportunity to get paid faster by facilitating early payment discounts, typically one and a half to two percent. And so suppliers can get paid faster even if their organizations or their customers' organizations have payment terms of 30 to 60 days or longer. So we also talked about how most of your suppliers want to use the invoicing. And as you heard from Trevor directly, uh, that certainly seems to be the case. So um, with that, I'll talk a little bit about OB10 and uh, sort of what we're all about. Um, OB10 is the trusted e-invoicing network uh, globally. So we are the undisputed leaders uh, in that space. 48% um, of the Fortune 500 uh, use OB10. Um, so that's fantastic. So again, if you decide to, to transition to OB10 uh, using e-invoicing, you would be an excellent company. Uh, OB10 is operational across uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, as well as the Americas and Asia Pacific. And it was designed from the ground up to be global in nature from day one. Uh, we also process um, over $140 billion of commerce, commerce through the network annually. In addition to that, uh, we integrate with a variety of host systems. So whether the customer or the supplier is using uh, SAP, PeopleSoft, JD Edwards, or a homegrown system, we can map and connect to that system. Uh, there's also a one-time connection. So as Trevor mentioned, he doesn't have to have multiple connections with multiple customers. He's connected to OB10. He's got access to all of his customers. So that's very beneficial for his organization as well. And we've got over a decade of experience. We were founded in 2000, and so we're working in our second decade now. And uh, we've got the expertise uh, from the last decade, and I, I believe that shows. Um, we're, all we're also um, unrivaled when it comes to our global capabilities, when it comes to understanding VAT and uh, the requirements each country has in place around e-invoicing. Nobody comes close. We are the experts in that area on both the AP and the AR side. So thank you again for, for your time, and I will turn it back over to Susie. Thank you very much indeed, Ernie. So we've got questions coming through thick and fast. If you haven't submitted your question yet, please do so. Um, first a question for you, please, Trevor. Uh, um, the viewer here would like to find out from you um, what format you're sending invoices through to the AB10 network in. We've got two formats. One is the standard EDIFACT D97A, and the other option we have is CXML, so we can use either. Okay. Um, and a question for you, please, Ernie. Um, I've got a question here about on interoperability. So, um, how do you, um, how does this work with the AB10 network, um, and how is the technical setup um, perhaps the same or different? to a more direct setup, and how long does it take? Lots of questions from Right. Yeah, and thank you for the question. We do have a number of uh, interoperability um, agreements in place uh, with other organizations around the world. So um, the connection, and I guess it's, it's fairly uh, transparent to uh, the customer as well as to the supplier. Um, you know, we, we do all the heavy lifting, the back office work uh, for our customers and for their suppliers as well. So we do have those agreements in place. Uh, we are proponents of that, um, uh, and that list continues to grow as well. And does it have any kind of impact on the speed at which suppliers are onboarded? Um, it's this, this, the difference in the speed is, is negligible. Um, it, it really doesn't uh, significantly uh, retard the process at all. Okay. Um, question here again about formats, and I'll put this one to you, please, Ernie. Um, can you just give us a view as to how many format types the the network um, supports, and does it support all industry formats and industry types? Um, for the most part, yes. Uh, OB10 does um, does uh, align itself and does accept a number of different industry formats. Um, 
you know, including XML, et cetera, uh, and a number of others. So, um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are fairly uh, system agnostic uh, when it comes to uh, connecting to our suppliers and to their customers. So, uh, in terms of the format that our customers uh, use, um, we uh, work directly with them, um, and we make sure that um, it's fairly seamless. So we basically are, are, are find ourselves accommodating a lot of our suppliers in that regard, and a, and a okay. number of our customers in that regard too. Okay. I mean, I suppose it, another question would be: Are there any formats that you you can't handle? Um, well, that's and that's a good question. Um, I think that may be a question, um, maybe an offline question, because it takes into account a number of different variables. But uh, we can certainly, um, you know, connect with the, the person who asked that question and, and follow up offline if, if that's acceptable. Okay. Do you do you validate supplier invoices to check that they are legally compliant? Um, yes, yes, we do, and uh, we have that set up, uh, especially in every country in which we're operational. We have that set up uh, before the supplier actually joins. So regardless of what country you're in, um, if you're a supplier and you're connecting to the OB10 network uh, and we are operational in that country, then it's it's really a foregone conclusion that that uh, compliance has been met. I'm not sure if we've lost Susie at the moment. Uh, I know she's got a hurricane coming through uh, the area. Hmm. Okay. Trevor, are you still connected? Yeah, I'm still connected. I think we just lost Susie. Okay. Yeah, I think we have. I think we have. Uh, and I think I've she got has connection back again. So if you can okay. hear me. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Hello. I've got connection. Hello. So sorry about that. Um. Um. That I've come through. Uh. So as far as the supply. Are these connections? I think we may have lost her. Again. We may have lost her again. Hello. Yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about this. Just um, as far as the supplier connections are concerned, I think we just have time for one last question anyway. As far as the supplier connections are concerned, um, how secure um, Stroke Encrypted are they? The OB10 um, has uh, redundant. Uh, encryption capabilities, uh, and uh, as you can imagine, a number of our customers uh, are in the financial services industry. So um, we are, in terms of our, our encryption capabilities, we are on par with those organizations, and they trust us to do that. So uh, we also replicate that uh, with every single customer. So uh, we are compliant. Uh, we are uh, very secure, and um, I think. That's a testament to the number of customers that have uh, joined OB10 and trust us uh, to handle their security in that respect. Okay, thank you. That was a short answer, which allows me to have time for one more question. Do you validate uh, your supplier, or how do you validate your supplier voices to check that they are indeed legally compliant? Yeah, how do we validate our supplier invoices to ensure that they or, are? Or do, do you validate your supplier invoices to ensure that they are legally compliant? How important is the legality piece for you? Well, the, the, the importance is, is fairly significant. And again, it, it, if it's from a um, country-specific perspective in terms of compliant, then, uh, compliance, then um, 
we, we have that set up initially before we actually enroll suppliers in a given country. In terms of uh, compliance from a, from a particular customer's perspective, uh, our customers tell us in terms of business rules and other areas where they have to have uh, compliance from their suppliers. And so we make sure that when we do the connection that those suppliers are connected and, um, and actually meet certain specif specifications and, and requirements in order to be, uh, in order to have those invoices validated before they're delivered on to the customer. So from a legal standpoint, whatever country we operate in, yes, we are compliant. Um, and then from a customer's perspective, um, whatever they have set up, we ensure that their suppliers um, are compliant and that those invoices are validated. Okay, good. Ernie, Martin, thank you very much indeed for your time. And uh, Trevor, thank you for giving us uh, a real insight into what makes suppliers want to come on board e-invoicing. I apologize for the, um, the loss of connection there. I just want to um, let you know that we've got uh, two more webinars coming up in the next few weeks, which you must put in your diary. Redesigning Global P2P at Unilever. Uh, join us on the 13th of November. And the Time Warner story. Join us on the 4th of November. If in the time being as well, uh, just be aware of our two conferences that we've got coming up um, in December and in March of next year. And in the time being, good luck with your e-invoicing initiatives. See you next time and goodbye. <laughs>